sorry, I'll go back a step. Uh, this event this evening is the Derrick Fielding Memorial Lecture. Derrick Fielding was the president of this council between 1975 and 1980. Uh, the first speaker this evening will be Mr. Roger Byron, who is a long-standing member of the executive, who also was a, a lecturer and the legal officer, the legal solicitor of the University of Queensland. Derek Fielding was the uh, chief librarian of the University of Queensland, and Derek and Roger were not only uh, colleagues, uh, but were very good friends. So. Roger will start the evening off by talking about Derek, and he will then introduce our speaker, who is Mr. Scott McDougall, the first uh, Queensland Human Rights Commissioner. So without any further ado, I will invite Roger to try and say a few words. Thank you, Roger. Good evening, uh, fellow members of the QCCL and friends, both present and virtual. Um, I was delighted when uh, Malcolm Cope asked me to introduce this year's Fielding lecture because Derek Fielding, as uh, Michael has said, was not only a great friend of mine and a colleague at UQ, but I most looked up to him of all uh, as my mentor in the early days of my work at UQ. He was a quietly spoken a uh, person who addressed issues in a scholarly and thoughtful way. But he could be forceful, and he was unafraid to say what needed to be said. Few could cavil at how he expressed the kernel of the QCCL's uh, creed 45 years ago. And I quote, The Council is not a political organisation. Rather, we are concerned to uphold certain traditional freedoms for which people have fought and died for centuries. We remain anxious that power be not used arbitrarily to the disadvantage of an individual and that those who hold power in society should themselves observe the law. Above all, said Derek, the most important value is compassion for individuals. Well friends, what Derek said then is as true today as it was in 1976. Derek's comment, his commitment and his capacity for hard work helped to revitalise QCCL in the mid 70s and to strengthen public awareness and criticism of the then BLP Peterson government whenever it moved to curtail civil liberties. And so QCCL honours Derek by organising this annual lecture in his name, presented by worthy speakers on topics of current interest. And this year is no exception. Scott McDoodle is to give us a review of the first year of the Queensland Human Rights Act, and who better than Scott? After, being, after honing his skills for 16 years at Caxton Street, Whereas Director Scott performed a critical role in the Campaign for Queensland Human Rights Act, he became Queensland's Anti-Discrimination Commissioner. So in his words, instead of banging his head against the brick wall of government for years, it was nice to be on the inside. Scott was actually warned that he might still be banging his head against the wall from the inside of government. If so, I want to tell you that he banged with signal success. His efforts were key to the success of the campaign and he was able to speak to us today as uh, Queensland's inaugural Human Rights Commissioner. Scott. Well, thank you very much, uh, Roger. And I can tell you that um, the hotel quarantine issue has given me a headache from banging my head on the wall. So, yes, you're right, I, I still am doing that. Um, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Hello to Facebook uh, people. Um, I've got about 35 minutes of material, I have to warn you. It's probably longer than I should have um, put in, but it's there. So for those of you at home, if you've made a cup of tea and, and 
the content sends you to sleep, just feel free to drift off to sleep. A copy of this speech will be available probably in about a month's time after we've uh, tabled, uh, or at least I've given the Attorney General our first Human Rights Annual Report, the drafter of which um, was a bit peeved with me for pinching a lot of her material for this um, article. So, the Human Rights Act 2019, a review of its first year. It's a pretty imaginative title. It's um, probably as imaginative as Shane Warne's uh, autobiography, which was um, called Shane Warne, My Autobiography. <laughs> um, we'll have to improve on that for the four year review, that's for sure. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. The site on which I'm speaking tonight happens to be Queensland's oldest Anglican church, erected in 1861. Just a few years before it was constructed, the traditional owners of this country gathered on the hill near the windmill on Wickham Terrace, and from that vantage point, they witnessed a decisive moment in the unrecognised war between South East Queensland's First Nations and the British colony of New South Wales. It was the execution of tribal warrior Dundalee. As it happens, the gruesome nature of the botched hanging of Dundalee in 1854, which happened just outside the uh, original jail, which is now the General Post Office, is reputed to have led to the banning of public executions when Queensland eventually became a col colony in 1859. An incremental improvement in human rights, perhaps, Yet we know that in the following decades, many thousands of unofficial executions took place throughout Queensland during the systematic dispersal of First Nations people by Queensland's Mounted Police. I do apologise for this rather sombre start to the talk, but since this nation and the state are yet to reach any formal settlement with our First Nations, I do think it's important to remind ourselves of the circumstances in which we now come to acknowledge the traditional owners of this particular part of the country. Thank you for the true delight of delivering this lecture named in honour of a man who contributed so much to the quality of Queensland's political and cultural discourse, particularly in the period from the mid 60s to the late 70s. Derek Fielding made many contributions toward improving civil liberties, as Roger said. Yet, of all of his contributions, it was his interest in supporting the right to protest which grabbed my attention. I'll have something to say a bit later on about the state of protest laws in Queensland, but in researching Derek Fielding, I found it both interesting and revealing to learn that while he was in charge of the Walter Harrison Law Library, he gave permission to UQ students to stage an all-night sit-in protest as long as there was no disorder or detriment to his library. Clearly, Mr Fielding was ahead of his time. By imposing what appears to have been reasonable and justifiable limitations on the students' rights to assembly and freedom of expression, he seems to have preempted the proportionality test which is now set out in the Human Rights Act. This test requires the balancing of a person's human rights with sometimes competing public interests, such as the need to maintain community order and safety, and I guess a neat and tidy library as well. Tonight I've been asked to review the first 12 months of the Act. I will frame my discussion around the three arms of government, which in the so-called dialogue model of human rights protection are encouraged to enter into a discourse about human rights. Although we are still very much in the early days of the Act, with the key operative provisions being only in place for the last 10 months, I think enough time has passed for us to take a sneak peek into the petri dish to see how our little human rights culture is growing and to offer at least some early impressions on the quality of the dialogue that has taken place to date. So let us begin with the obligations on the public sector. One of the three objects of the Act 
is to build a culture in the Queensland public sector that respects and promotes human rights. This raises a number of important questions. What is a human rights culture? How do we build it? And how do we know when we've built it? In her second reading speech on the Human, on the human Rights Bill, the Honourable Yvette Darth, Attorney General and Minister for Justice, provided some insight into what was intended by this object. She said, the Human Rights Bill is about changing the culture of the public sector by putting people first in all that we do. This is about a modern Queensland, a fair Queensland, and a responsive Queensland. A culture of human rights indicates that much more is required than mere compliance with the Act. The concept of building a culture acknowledges that it will take time. There will be progress and setbacks. The dialogue model, which prioritises discussion, awareness raising and education over enforcement and compliance, supports this goal by building gradually towards a human rights culture. While many public entities will start in compliance mode, my hope is that the public sector will move towards a culture in which protecting and promoting the human rights of people, the clients, stakeholders and staff becomes part of the everyday business of the organisation. But what is the incentive to build this responsive culture? At the very heart of the Human Rights Act are the obligations imposed upon public entities. In my view, the ultimate success of the Act depends on the enforcement of Section 58, which provides it is unlawful for a public entity, A, to act or make a decision in a way that is not compatible with human rights, or B, in making a decision to fail to give proper consideration to a human right relevant to the decision. I've tried to put myself in the shoes of a leader of a public entity confronted by these obligations, which incidentally is quite easy since I am the leader of an entity that is obliged to meet these obligations. It is quite daunting, I have to say, to consider that my actions and decisions require me to both give consideration to the newly protected human rights in order to meet the procedural requirements of the Act and ensure that the actions of my organisation are substantively compatible with those human rights. To manage that risk as the CEO of a public entity, I would be prompted to identify which human rights are likely to be engaged by my staff's actions and ensure any restrictions on those rights are able to be justified. To this end, I'm pleased to say that many public entities in Queensland, state government departments, councils and functional public entities, have in fact undertaken significant review reviews of their legislation, policies and procedures to assess their compatibility with human rights. And I'm sure that these reviews have already delivered many improvements in decision making and service delivery. For example, one agency reviewed their policy uh, for human rights compliance and identified that it was important to increase their clients' awareness of the availability of uh, interpreter services. So they decided to put up more signs in their building. Returning to my concern about Section 58, my anxiety as a public entity CEO might be alleviated to some extent by considering the potential repercussions for failing to comply with the obligation. Section 58.6 confirms that it is not an offence merely because someone acts or makes a decision in contravention of the obligations, and that any act or decision is not invalid merely because of such a contravention. So beyond the personal commitment of public officials, what incentive is there for a public entity to act compatibly with human rights. That is, how are these potentially unlawful breaches of human rights obligations actually enforced? After all, without effective enforcement, 
it would be easy to envisage the obligations becoming little more than bureaucratic and perfunctory tick and flick exercises rather than robust culture builders. Queensland's Human Rights Act provides two basic methods of enforcement. The first is the piggyback action, where a person piggybacks a human rights claim on an independent cause of action. For example, an application for judicial review of an administrative decision. The second means of enforcement is unique to Queensland's Human Rights Act. The alternative provides for complaints to the Queensland Human Rights Commission. Unless there are exceptional circumstances, a complainant must first complain directly to the public entity and a period of 45 business days must have elapsed before coming to the Commission. In handling the complaint, the Commission may decide to, con to convene a conciliation conference to attempt to resolve it. But unlike discrimination complaints, an unresolved human rights complaint cannot continue to be agitated in a tribunal or court if it is not resolved at the conciliation stage. You might be forgiven at this point for thinking that the complaint process is therefore toothless. However, importantly, the Commission may publish information about unresolved complaints, including any recommendations about the steps that should be taken by the public entity to ensure that it acts compatibly with human rights in the future. And in fact, the Commission is now very close to publishing its first recommendation about an unresolved complaint. And obviously I can't talk about it, I was hoping to talk about it tonight, but I can't talk about it yet. This reporting mechanism represents a significant improvement on the Victorian and, and ACT human rights legislation as it provides free and direct access to a form of redress that would otherwise only be at best potentially available by going to a court or a tribunal. Further, although the Commission's recommendations are not enforceable, they may extend to systemic issues and therefore lead to changes in, pol in policy and culture that would not necessarily be available in litigation, the outcomes of which are generally confined to the particular legal interests of the parties and to the powers of the court. The big question here is whether the potential loss of bargaining power of a complainant who is unable to press their complaint to litigation is offset by the Commission's ability to make public recommendations about what is required to achieve human rights compatibility. So how effective have these two enforcement provisions been in protecting human rights? To date, I'm not aware of any piggyback claims that have progressed all the way through the courts, although the Commission did intervene in a judicial review application about a matter involving a prisoner held in solitary confinement for over seven years that was heard in the Supreme Court um, yesterday and, and today. Uh, in terms of complaints, as at 30 September, the Commission has received 176 complaints against public entities alleging human rights contraventions. The, uh, the Commission accepted 98 of these complaints and conciliated 18 of them. Around 43% of the complaints made to the Commission about human rights were combined claims in which the primary complaint was discrimination with a human rights claim piggybacked onto it. A number of those complaints have been resolved through the conciliation process and I'll give you some examples of successful outcomes that have been achieved in these human rights claims as well as the combined piggyback claims. One successful matter which I think clearly demonstrates the potential of the Act involved an extended family of five adults who recently returned from overseas with a toddler who has autism, only to find themselves detained in a hotel quarantine environment that was completely unsuitable for the child's needs. In what was, I'm sure, a very pleasing result for all concerned, within just hours of their complaint being referred to the Commission, they were allowed to home quarantine. 
And I think this outcome definitely meets the Attorney-General's aim of a responsive Queensland, if not a fair Queensland. Other examples of successful conciliation outcomes include a homeless man who had a medical condition that required him to access a public, a public toilet uh, up to 20 times a day, lived in a, a van. He alleged that local council work, uh, workers had breached his right to privacy by repeatedly fining him. At the conciliation, his illegal camping fines of $3,000 were withdrawn by the, by the council, who also reimbursed him for fines that he had already paid. A woman who had experienced domestic violence from the father of, of her child reached agreement with the hospital so that in future it would not require the presence of the father by phone at any consultations about the child's medical condition and that medical information about the child would be provided to the father separately. A teenager held on remand in youth detention during COVID-19 desperately wanted to see his family on his birthday. The parties agreed to a plan for maintaining family contact that included a one hour video call. Doesn't sound like much, but it made a, makes a huge difference to a child in detention. An Aboriginal woman with a disability together with her children, some of whom also have disabilities, was evicted from social housing. The complaint was settled for a financial sum. This was one of the piggyback matters, so a discrimination complaint where damages are available. And the social housing provider agreed to support her to apply for accessible accommodation in her local area. From our preliminary experiences, I suggest it's still too early to say whether the enforcement mechanisms of the Act will be effective in driving a strong human rights culture. I do think, though, it is possible to make some observations about the role of the complaint mechanism. Firstly, public entities have, on the whole, been very responsive to human rights complaints. So far, nine pure human rights complaints have been resolved at conciliation, as have nine combined com claims. The conciliation process appears to be providing a safe place for agencies to creatively explore less restrictive alternatives without the threat of litigation. Secondly, complainants are much better positioned to achieve successful outcomes when they have access to legal representation to help frame the complaints, if not actually advocate for the complainants. Thirdly, anecdotally, Public entities appear to have improved their internal complaints procedures in order to take advantage of the opportunity to resolve complaints before they progress to the Commission. We've heard from advocates that this seems to be happening in the areas of health, housing and child protection. So it would seem that the Act has already improved the quality of public sector complaints management. Beyond responsiveness to complaints, have we seen other indicia of a human rights culture growing within the public sector? There are some positive as well as negative examples I can point to. Firstly, when the Black Lives Matter protest was being planned in Brisbane in June this year, at a still very tense time of the pandemic, the Queensland Police Service consulted the Commission about the organisational posture that would be adopted in managing the protest. I have to admit that it was very pleasing to watch the news a few days later and see the police handing out masks instead of handing out fines and dispensing sanitizer instead of, instead of capsicum spray. However, this constructive approach to facilitating the rights to freedom of assembly and freedom of expression can be contrasted with the protest laws introduced in late 2019, shortly before the commencement of the Act's operative provisions. These laws criminalised the unreasonable use of dangerous attachment devices and authorised police to stop and search vehicles and to confiscate these items, which, by the way, are not unlawful to possess, 
only unlawful to use unreasonably. What is unreasonable in the context of protests about government inaction on the existential threat posed by global warming? No doubt the delays caused to Brisbane commuters by citizens concerned about their children's futures caused much annoyance to many and in part led to the introduction of the laws. Yet those delays to workers now seem quite trifling when compared to the disruption caused by the necessary and decisive response to the COVID-19 pandemic. In a human rights analysis, it is the right to life, and in particular, the positive obligations imposed on governments to protect life, that have justified the various restrictions on our freedoms that our Chief Health Officer has herself described as draconian. What do we make then of the positive obligations on governments to protect the right to life threatened by climate change? This is a question that several Torres Strait Island communities are asking of the United Nations Human Rights Committee. The World Health Organization says that between 2030 and 2050, climate change will cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress. So it will be very interesting to see the outcome of this international complaint. To sum up the review of the public sector's implementation of the Act, we will know we have built a strong human rights culture in Queensland when public entities routinely consider the impact of their decisions on human rights and actively explore less restrictive alternatives to achieve their objectives. Experience from Victoria and elsewhere suggests that to achieve this, the public sector will require not just strong leadership from chief executives, but also strong encouragement from the courts and through the Commission's novel complaints and conciliation process. In the event that these mechanisms ultimately prove to be ineffective, other potential enforcement options might need to be considered at the four-year review of the Act, including creating a direct cause of action and creating access to damages. Other options that might need to be considered include extending the powers of the Commission to issue compliance notices, enter into enforceable undertakings, or apply to the court directly for an order requiring compliance. Now let's look at the role played by the 56th Parliament of Queensland in meeting its obligations under the Act. Remember, it was the 56th Parliament that passed the Human Rights Act on 27 February 2019, so you would expect to see a high level of commitment to its implementation. As you may be aware, under the Act, a member introducing a bill must table a statement of compatibility, setting out not just their opinion of whether the, whether the bill is compatible with human rights, but also how it is compatible. That statement of compatibility is scrutinised by the relevant portfolio committee, which must then report to the Legislative Assembly about whether the bill is not compatible. Since the commencement of this obligation, we have seen 28 bills introduced accompanied by statements of compatibility. While the quality of the statements to date has, on the whole, been satisfactory, I think that the Portfolio Committee's scrutiny of the demonstrable justification of limitations requires a level of expertise and rigour that will hopefully develop in coming years. In this respect, we have welcomed the establishment of a panel of human rights experts to support the various committees. The panel includes Dr. Philip Chimint, sorry, Chimindus, formerly the Director of the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute based in London. And we certainly hope that the 57th Parliament will draw upon the panel very regularly in its term. Whilst there may be a degree of cynicism about the effectiveness of the committee system in scrutinising new legislation, there can be no doubt that the Human Rights Act has improved the framework 
in which rights are now identified and considered by our unicameral parliament. To this end, I would encourage all Queenslanders to take advantage of the opportunity to directly participate in the lawmaking process by making submissions about the impact of proposed laws on their human rights. Various members of parliament have pointed out to me that public submissions are not just important in placing positions on the record and presenting evidence, they are also helpful to future parliamentarians in developing new laws. In the time that's left, I will briefly consider how Queensland's courts and tribunals have applied the Act. In Victoria, the development of the human rights jurisprudence benefited greatly from the leadership of the now retired Justice, the Honourable Kevin Bell. Firstly, in his role as a VCAT member and later as a Justice of the Victorian Supreme Court. Even so, it took several years before the Supreme Court's decisions in the Recertain Children litigation uh, demonstrated that the Victorian Charter was capable of delivering hard law, in that case by issuing a mandatory injunction to remove children from the Barwon adult prison. In Queensland, we're yet to see whether our judiciary and the legal profession more generally views the Act as a superfluous distraction or a useful additional tool for ensuring executive power is exercised appropriately and proportionately. I understand that, that in the Magistrates' Court, the Act is frequently invoked to support bail applications. And in, and in the early days of the Act, it was successfully relied upon to resist an adjournment of a trial on Thursday Island, which ultimately led to the charges being withdrawn. So far, there have been only a small number of cases in which the Supreme Court has had to consider the Act, and the Commission is closely monitoring proceedings to assess whether to in intervene in these matters. In Australian Institute for Progress versus Electoral Commission Queensland, a politically active think tank sought a declaration that it was permitted to accept donations from property developers to incur political expenditure something that seems to be in the news a bit lately. Justice Applegarth, ruling against the applicant, found the purpose of preventing corruption and undue influence in government is consistent with a free and democratic society based on human dignity, equality and freedom. In the state of Queensland versus Jonathan Shree and others, Justice Applegarth again applied the proportionality test to issue an urgent injunction restraining a blockade of the Story Bridge while acknowledging the importance of the right to peaceful assembly. Clearly, the important test cases determining some key questions of law lie ahead of us, and it will be of great interest to observe the extent to which Queensland's courts are prepared to borrow from international human rights jurisprudence, access to which they are now expressly permitted. Of course, the extent to which courts are able to engage with the Act to develop a healthy human rights jurisprudence in Queensland is largely dependent on the manner in which cases are presented to them by the profession. There is a leadership role here for the legal profession and I'm pleased that both the Queensland Law Society and the Bar Association of Queensland have established human rights committees that have been active in promoting awareness of the Act's potential application. To sum up, I believe that the three arms of government have made a promising start in the pursuit of the Attorney-General's goal of creating a modern, fair and responsive public sector in Queensland by building a strong human rights culture. Whether we achieve that goal rests on the leadership of our public entities, parliamentarians, and importantly, on the preparedness of our judiciary to take up the mantle of human rights. Yes, there will be a need for some human rights heroes. Lucky for Michael. However, upholding human rights is as much about common sense as it is about common decency. It is about people like Derek Fielding 
making empathetic, practical and proportionate decisions to accommodate rights that, to quote from the Act's preamble, are essential in a democratic and inclusive society. So we must not leave the job of building the human rights culture only to judges, lawyers and bureaucrats. We can all play a, play a role. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, government is people. The ultimate triumph of democracy depends on the individual use of democratic principles. In Queensland, we now have an act that makes it easier for each of us to use those principles to ensure that our democracy is triumphant. Thank you. Yes, uh, so Scott is happy to take some questions if anybody has some questions. I was going to try and figure out whether they would hear myself, do I? I think I got most of the questions before we even started. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The question I was going to ask him, he can't answer. So, Angus, do you want to ask a question? As I said, there's two rights in our act that are different or come from the international problem of economic, cultural, and social rights right to education and right to health. Have either of those rights been engaged in? Uh, certainly not yet in the courts. Um, and yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see how the courts um, deal with those. And I, I've talked in other forums about, you know, in my experience as a discrimination lawyer in the past, um, the reticence of the courts to wade into policy decisions that have dollar, dollars attached to the outcomes. And so I think the courts are going to be particularly wary when they do actually get to engage on those rights. But, you know, the reality is they do make decisions every day in commercial matters with huge dollars attached to them. And sometimes the parties include state governments. So, you know, it's just a different jurisdiction, same principle. So I think they ought to, but they certainly it's going to take a lot to get them there. Yeah. Um, so, um, if anybody on Facebook has a question, we uh, are prepared to take them. But at the moment, we'll ask. Ali, do you want to? Yes. Um, I'm, and I'm a law student, and I think that the Australian Human Rights Act is quite Um, I can't give you legal advice, um, but you could get some legal advice. I can uh, tell you that, um, and it's not in our jurisdiction, so I referred to the um, Torres Strait complaint, international complaint, to the UN Human Rights Committee, which, as I said, it's going to be very interesting to see how that goes. But there is a decision uh, from uh, the Dutch Supreme Court from December last year, where the court upheld the right to life and the right to privacy and ordered that the Dutch government reduce their emissions by 25% of, I think, 1990 levels. I could be wrong about that. Um, within a very short period of time. So <laughs> you talk about re certain children being hard law. That's extremely hard law. Um, and so there, there's a precedent out there. Whether Australian courts are prepared to go there is another thing. There's a question from Facebook. Um, what recommendations would you make at, the, at this early stage of the HRA's operations to improve the existing powers and procedures of the Act? Powers and procedures. Well, I, I talked about some of the powers that might, they might need to think about at the review. Look, the big thing for me is, um, you know, when you look at the successful human rights claims, you know, not just in Queensland, in, around the world, they're generally vulnerable people who are the, the complainants and they have a lawyer. <laughs> so we need uh, legal representation for people who are going to actually make complaints. It saves government agencies time in responding to otherwise complaint, you know, 
unmeritorious complaints. Um, and so that would be, I think, the, s the single biggest wish I would have at this, this point to improve the system. This gentleman here. Thank you. My name is Sam Sam. Thank you, Scott, it was really interesting. Thank you very much. Converting humans uh, right into culture is something really a hard work, of course. And I would love to ask uh, about uh, the steps that the Act has done in fighting discrimination into the Australian uh, community and the Australian uh, justice system, and the Australian you know, the whole system. Yeah, so the question was about the impact of the Act on discrimination. Yes. Um, so it's important to remember, even though the, the Commission has changed its name to the Human Rights Commission, we still have all the functions that we had under the Anti-Discrimination Act, which continues unchanged. Um, there is a really interesting um, potential development that has not yet been explored. Um, that will arise out of the Human Rights Act coming into Queensland, and that is, unlike Victoria, the definition of discrimination in the Human Rights Act is not limited to the definition in the Anti-Discrimination Act. So, potentially, it can be expanded to include international jurisprudence about discrimination. Without boring you, um, discrimination lawyers can get excited about this because Proving discrimination, everyone knows when they've been discriminated against, but it's an entirely different thing to then go to a court and prove it. And it's very technical, and so the international jurisprudence potentially could make it a lot more simple. My question was, in terms of converting human rights into culture. Into culture, into culture. Oh, okay. What did you do? What did the Act introduce into converting, uh, fighting discrimination? Or abolishing discrimination into the culture, our culture. What did you come up So you mean broader than the public sector yes. into the broader community yeah, culture? Yes. Yeah. So we do have a function in creating public awareness around human rights. Um, every December we run Human Rights Month where we get out into the community and try to um, educate people as much as possible about their human rights. Um, this year, obviously, with COVID, it's been extremely difficult for us to get out into the community. I'm really looking forward to, to when we can. I have to tell you, I really do miss the engagement with uh, community groups. Um, but I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but the Act itself is really primarily focused on government decision making rather than promoting human rights culture generally in the community, although it is it is there, and it's in the Anti-Discrimination Act. Yes. Uh, hi, Chris Bigger for Keller, my name is. Uh, you mentioned before there was an instance where the Commission had intervened in the case. Can you take us inside the decision making and guess about what types of cases you're looking to intervene in, and, and how many cases have, has the Commission actually intervened in? Yeah, good, good question. Um, we have intervention guidelines that you can see on our website if you're interested. Um, which look at the, con the considerations that we apply. Um, we've intervened in three. So the two cases before Justice Applegarth that I mentioned and one yesterday and today, which was the solitary confinement case. Uh, we've looked at a few others. Um, we, we've been looking at you know, some of the key uh, issues that need to be settled so I could get into a very technical <laughs> discussion with you that would probably bore everyone, but um, Section 13, obviously the key provision in the Act, um, where the court lands on that, and Section 48, which is the interpretation command, um, where the court lands on that, they're really important. So if we think that a court's going to touch upon those, we want to be at the bar table, yeah. Any other questions over in the room? Oh, yes. Yeah, just, just a technical question on that topic. Um, how, how does the Commission get notified that something's got an in intervention of the Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a requirement in the Act to provide notice to the Attorney General and to the Commission when a question of law arising from the Act um, is raised in proceedings. So that's up to the parties? Yeah.
Yeah. And we found that um, lawyers seem to be pretty good at that. The Law Society, I noticed, sent a reminder around uh, to the legal profession, reminding them to, to do it. Um, so, yeah, it, I think it's been pretty good. But I don't know what I don't know. Maybe there's all these cases that I haven't been given notice of. I hope not. Any other questions over here or on Facebook? No? All right. Well, uh, um, in taking Scott, I mean, I wanted to make uh, uh, two points. Um, the first point is it's, it's good, finally, to have someone inside the government banging their head against the wall while we bang our head against the wall on the outside. And it's been a pleasure to read some of the submissions to the Parliamentary Committee, which uh, usually uh, all you get is us and the Law Society on occasion of the Bar Association. And quite frankly, quite often the Law Society is uh, not, their submissions don't really address uh, human rights issues and civil liberties issues. And the other thing is I was quite interested in some of the examples that Scott gave about some of the things that they've been able to conciliate because those are just the sort of examples that we were putting up to the Attorney General and people when we were campaigning for this legislation. It's those small daily sort of things that we're talking about where we argue that this act will make a difference to people's lives. It's not about lawyers turning up in court, although that's all very nice. It's about having this legislation there so that people could turn up and say, I have this right, you need to take it into account. And that resulting in people, in the change of behaviour of public servants and the government. And it's good to see those examples. So on behalf of the Council, Scott, I thank you for your contribution this evening. And I have the traditional uh, thank you gift. And hopefully appropriately priced. So <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in trouble. <laughs> oh, 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 well, well, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, yeah, something thank like you. that. Uh, somebody will be able to find the right receipt on the back of a, something or other for it, I'm sure. Um, anyway, so uh, thank you very, everyone for your attendance, including here and on Facebook. Um, with the COVID situation, I can't announce our next event, but hopefully things will improve and next year we'll be able to um, uh, put some more events on. Um, and uh, for those who missed the AGM, uh, if you are not a member, please uh, join uh, because uh, we are run on the smell of an oily rag, probably less than that at the moment. Um, and if you can make a donation, that would also be great for you can do so at our website. So that will bring an end to the proceedings. Thank oh, uh, this will be recorded um, and it will also be put on YouTube um, as soon as that's sorted out. Anyway, I think that's all the things I have to say. Catherine's not saying anything else. Anyway, thank you very much for your attendance. Bye-bye. Thank you, Scott. So, yeah.